Hello and welcome to Answer Coral Live. And um, we've got a very special Meet a Coral Scientist session for you today. This is a STEM club session. And what we're aiming to do over the next 45 minutes is give you an insight into the life of a coral scientist and then answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, before we connect live to the Kamabi Research Centre in uh, Curaçao, we have some very special shout outs to give you. We have uh, countries, we have the U students from the UK, France and India joining us and some special shout outs. Welcome to Saracens High in London. A, a very good afternoon uh, to all students joining us from Bampton ha House School in the UK. Hello uh, from STS World School in Raj Gamal in the Punjab in India. And a big welcome um, to our happy homeschoolers dialing in from Brittany in France. Uh, but a very, very important hello to Ben. Ben, can you hear us? Hey, yeah, I hear you very well. How are you doing? Uh, we're doing very, very well. And uh, how is everything out in Curaçao? You're inside uh, in the tropics. Uh, are we having a tropical storm at the moment? Well, not that much storm, but a lot of rain, a lot of rain. We tried it outside before, but then um, even d despite a little roof, what we had got completely wet. And uh, actually, I'm still a bit wet, uh, but it's better for now to do it here. Otherwise, my laptop might make problems there. And you're at our home from home that's uh, over the past coral lives at the Kamabi Research Station in, in Curaçao um, in the Southern Caribbean. For viewers who don't know what a research station is, uh, what's going on around you? Um, why, why a research station? Well, a research station is basically like a special hotel for scientists. So yes, we have rooms there where we can stay, but um, instead of having a sauna or a pool, what we have here are also laboratories where we can analyze our samples. We have boats for which we can go out for diving. You can rent uh, scuba gear, scuba equipment. You can collect samples, bring them back. We have aquarium uh, facilities. So whatever samples you bring back, you can also have live animals there and do some more in-depth experiments. And it's, of course, a great place to meet other scientists, get together, discuss new ideas and, and come up with uh, new uh, research. Ben, um, we've got some great questions that have both been submitted uh, in advance and also coming through on the live chat. Um, just before we get started, uh, for those watching, if you haven't joined one of our sessions before, there are two ways to submit questions live. Uh, the first is using YouTube chat, and that's using the, the bar um, beside uh, the screen. Um, you do need to be logged in, uh, so uh, great to have an adult do that. Um, it's a parent, care, care a guardian at home or a teacher at school. Uh, and then you can post questions. Um, Sim is moderating, and he will send those through to me, and those will inform the discussion uh, that we have with Ben today. Um, there's also a uh, live chat button, um, and that is on the Encounter EDU website. If you click on that, that will also get you through um, to uh, Sim, and he will be able to send those through to us. Um, but before we get started with the questions, uh, Ben, it'd be great to find out sort of what what's, what what do you study? What's what's taken you uh, to Curaçao? Well, I'm studying sponges and uh, what uh, sponges do. And it is a rather complicated topic. And uh, therefore, I prepared a little uh, video, a couple of slides with explanations. And I think it might be good to first go uh, through these slides, uh, play that I think it's like four minutes or so. And afterwards, we can discuss into it and maybe go a little bit more in, in, into depth and explain Again, some questions that might still be open after that, but maybe let's start with that first. Already Charles Darwin was wondering how coral reefs can display such a high diversity and productivity despite being surrounded by nutrient poor ocean. The low levels of nutrients you can see 
for example, by the crystal clear waters compared to many more turbid, nutrient-rich coastal areas. Particularly when having a closer look underwater, you can clearly see why Darwin compared coral reefs to an oasis in a marine desert. Photosynthesis of corals and algae by which sunlight and water is converted to sugars and other compounds forms the foundation of these unique ecosystems. However, up to 50% of these products are getting released into the water as dissolved organic matter or DOM. Unfortunately, the majority of reef animals can not take up this DOM. Instead, it is taken up by microbes, which in turn are eaten by small animals, so-called protists. Protists themselves are then eaten by small shrimps and fishes and thereby energy and nutrients initially stored in DOM is passed through the food chain until it finally ends up in top predators such as sharks. All animals release waste products which fuel further growth of corals and algae. This recycling pathway is commonly referred to as the microbial loop. In our working group at the University of Amsterdam, we investigate how sponges can similarly take up large amounts of dissolved organic matter. Jasper de Huy, the head of our working group, found out that sponge cells are reproducing rapidly. However, the actual growth of sponges is rather slow. So how can that be? It turns out that sponges constantly release old cells as detritus, which are then replaced by new cells. The detritus is then taken up by small crustaceans and fishes, so-called detritivores. And similar to the microbial loop, energy and nutrients are so passed up the food chain. This mechanism is also referred to as the sponge loop. Microbes and sponges thereby make DOM available to the coral reef community and prevent that half of the primary production by corals and algae is getting lost. Both loops are important recycling mechanisms that help reefs to develop under nutrient-poor conditions. However, the situation today is often very different. Nutrient inputs from land promote the growth of algae, whereas many herbivores are scarce due to overfishing, which results in an increase of algae and concomitant decrease of corals. This does not only affect the structure and look of the reef, but also the recycling of DOM. Algae release more DOM than corals, and this algal DOM is the preferred food source of microbes, causing a faster microbial growth. So DOM is taken up rapidly, but processed rather inefficiently. Moreover, some of these microbes can cause fish and coral disease. When corals are getting sick, they can be easier overgrown by algae, which in turn produce more DOM. This mechanism is referred to as the microbialization of reefs. The big question is now, what is the role of sponges in this? Do they promote or buffer against the microbialization of reefs. And this is exactly what I am working on. Ben, uh, a lot to unpack there, some, some serious science you're engaged in. I think maybe just to start to unpick uh, some of that marine science, I don't know whether all our students are familiar with how life works in the ocean compared to on land. But you mentioned up front there the paradox, the sort of problem that Darwin had, understanding how much life was around coral reefs. You talk about clear and, and cloudy, or, or I think the word he uses, turbid. Why, how does food manifest itself in the ocean uh, through turbid or cloudy waters? Yeah, so so basically the, the turbidity often you have 
uh, caused by small, tiny little algae, uh, phytoplankton that you have in in the ocean that makes it this greenish. And they are plants. And as we know also from our garden, if we have special plants, we have to per, put fertilizer. So we have to give them extra nutrients that they can grow. And the same principle is also in the ocean. So if you have more nutrients there, then these algae have more to grow on, are better fertilized, and then the water is rather getting greenish, uh, murky. And on coral reefs, you don't have that. There are very, very few nutrients only, and that is why there are less algae, and therefore the water is crystal clear. And, and you, you talk about this DOM um, thing. Is, so so there's this, does that mean there's another type of, of food energy that exists in these clear waters that isn't this this cloudy making algae yes exactly so so basically similar to what we also have we can eat and and we can drink so there there is food that we can we can basically chew on and what we eat and that would be the algae that would be bacteria it would be small fish or other things what you have in the water but then you have also these uh, dissolved organic substances that you have in there, or DOM, that was uh, explained earlier, and you can you can think about it as um, there are many many different types of uh, molecules that are basically uh, together, but most of them cannot be taken up. So uh, most animals cannot use most animals cannot use the um, dissolved substances anyways, but the sponges and microbes can. But most of the substances, even they cannot. And that is what we can see here with these dried beans and chickpeas. So that is something also what we, as it is right now, wouldn't like to eat. What we would much rather like to eat is uh, our M&Ms, as I have here. However, most of the, if you put it here in here, most of the DOM is actually not can be taken up only around 20%, and that are the M&Ms. And that really brings me, these M&Ms basically bring me to my research question, because I want to see sponges and microbes, they can both eat M&Ms, so these parts of the DOM, but is it that they can eat all of the M&Ms, or is it, for example, that sponges say, hey, I really like the green ones, I only eat green M&Ms. And the question is, what do the microbes do? Are they also eating green M&Ms? Or are they say like, no, I only like, let's say, red M&Ms. And uh, that has implications on uh, the microbialization that um, I was uh, mentioning before or what we saw in the, in the video. Because um, if sponges and microbes would feed both on green M&Ms, then uh, they would be competing for that food source. That would mean that at one point when these M&Ms are not there anymore, then you cannot grow further. Whereas if you say like the sponges go for the green M&Ms and the microbes for the red ones, then there is no competition and they can both do their thing and they have more than enough food to eat. And so, I mean, just going back to, to Darwin's paradox, how is there so much life in the ocean? Our traditional idea um, and, and what Darwin came to was that um, corals themselves play a role in providing food for all the animals um, that, that thrive on the reef. And sponge also, you're finding out that sponge also play a role, but how, how, how does coral help? Um, first of all, and we'll come to the sponge bit later. So Without corals, there are no coral reefs because coral, they built the structure where a sponge cannot just um, grow somewhere on sand or whatever. So they need hard substrates. So, and they grow on old coral skeletons. So that is number one. Coral reefs are built by corals. So that is a very important part. And the other part is when you then think about the, the, the feeding, uh, what was also mentioned in the video that up to 50% 50, 50 of the sugars that, uh, al that the corals or algae produce with the photosynthesis are released again in the ocean. And as most animals cannot take it up, 
all of that energy would be lost. It would be just going to the open ocean and will be going away from the coral reef. If you're very limited, you don't want it. You want to be as efficient as possible and you want to use, make use of that. And that is what the microbes do. But sponges, as they filter sometimes thousands of liters of water uh, per day, they take up these, uh, these uh, sugars, the dissolved substances, and make them into nice goodies, into these uh, detritus cells that can be, can be taken up by all the other animals. So they keep the energy on the reef and keep it recycling, keep it recycling. Basically, what we also should do with, uh, with our waste management, we try to recycle as much as possible and not always just buy new and throw things away. Amazing. So, so sponges, the great recyclers of the underwater world. And, and really, I've just seen a question come in from George, and it sort of follows on from this. Um, it's, it's asking sort of like, what are sponges? What, they, what do they do? And there's a little bit of this pumping in and stage. And, and, and why are they important? So uh, sponges are animals. They maybe look more like a plant, but they are actually animals. And they are the oldest multicellular um, organisms, uh, animals that are still alive. So they are much, much older than dinosaurs or any other organism you can, you can uh, think about. And what sponges do, they, they uh, sit, sit there and they cannot move. So the only way they can get to food is by pumping water. And they pump a lot of water a lot. And uh, Ellie can show now a nice video where we have a big, uh, a giant barrel sponge. It's a huge sponge. And if you put a little bit of dye in the water next to it, you can see how it's going first into the sponge. And after a few seconds, it's coming out of the opening of the sponge again. And you can really see in that short period of time that um, sponges are able to take up uh, bacteria and other part particles that are in the water, but also these dissolved substances. And you see how much water they pump. Like I said, a sponge like that can uh, filter several thousands of liters of water per day. And if you look at the whole Caribbean basin, the whole Caribbean Sea, all sponges that are in the Caribbean filter the same amount of water as in three days as is in the Caribbean. So every three days, the whole Caribbean is basically filtered. And so sponges take up a lot of things out of the water. They take out these, for example, bacteria. Bacteria can be good, but bacteria can also be bad if there are certain pathogens there, or if there are just too many of these, they also make the water more turbid, so you can't uh, see less far. And um, then, of course, uh, the sponge group that was mentioned before, that sponges are there to just bring food, convert uh, the dissolved part into uh, in, into particles that can be taken up by other organisms. So I think that are the two main main functions why sponges are important on a reef. In, in, incredible. And I've got some really lovely uh, sponge questions coming through from Wimbledon High, asking whether sponges sleep and, and do they, in fact, have any senses? Well, if they sleep, so uh, it would be difficult to say because, well, obviously they don't have eyes. So they don't see when they're actually closing their eyes. Uh, what you can, and I don't know if sleep is a good concept there, but what you can say is that sponges, they don't pump all the time. So they can also sometimes stop pumping and uh, rest, uh, basically. We don't know much about it. We don't know at what intervals that is, uh, or are there certain cues or triggers that make them stop? And when do they start again pumping? Um, it seems that they are pumping also at night, but sometimes they just shut down for an hour or two and then they start again. Um, and to, can, they, can they sense? Yes, they can. So, and, and that is really surprising because in general, they are very, very basic animals. They don't have real tissues. Basically all the cells are, are or a lot of the cells can also move within, within the body. They do not have uh, nerves, but still they can sense. They, can, they, they, they need to sense to, to, to do their pumping. They need to figure out, okay, which parts of food do I actually take up? Or is it a food particle that I want to eat? Or is it, for example, sediment or small sand grains that are coming uh, with the rivers on the, uh, on the reef? So they are able to do that. And we still don't know exactly how they manage to do so. 
And then just following up from that, you've, you've talked about sensing different types of, of particle coming in, in, into their bodies. Uh, Follow-up question is, how do sponges digest food if they don't have a, a stomach? It's basically that they, that they uh, have then cells, which will then engulf the particles and they will basically, what we are doing in our stomach, they are doing it in, in cells. And that also shows you already that it's much smaller particles basically that they're eating. So they wouldn't be able to eat a steak or uh, even a M&M would be way too big for them. So it has to be much smaller. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, from from Gutenberg Schuler, um, an interesting question here on, on sponges. How, how do they reproduce? How do so they, there are two ways how they can reproduce, similar what we also have with many plants. So either they can do budding, basically, where they just make small clones um, that grow at the side of themselves. And then you have a new individual, which is the exact copy, basically, of the big adult animal, which is a great way if you want over a very short time period, want to have a lot of offspring, want to have a lot of sponges in an area. Um, and then there is also sexual reproduction and similar to corals, which uh, also do spawning. So they release uh, eggs and, and sperm. Sponges are doing the same thing, but we know much, much less about the spawning of sponges, when they do it, at what times is it, is it every, uh, every uh, only once a year or, or more often in the months. So they do both sexually, where they do the spawning or uh, budding. And thank you. And and quick, quick question coming here. We're talking about pumping fluid um, and sort of you know pumping the ocean uh, through them. Um, from Wimbledon High was whether they have anything like a heart um, to to pump fluid sort of through through, through their bodies. No, they don't have a, they don't have a, a, a heart, and they also don't have like uh, veins and and arteries or whatever. So basically. A sponge is, in principle, a big pump itself, and they have tiny little cells with a with a with a small flagellum at them, and the flagellum is always uh, rotating, and by that they create a water flow and suck basically water in them. And also, a lot of sponges they look like a chimney, and similar to to a chimney, just by the water flow when the water flows over the reef, it's also pressed basically in the sponge and then goes up. So you, on the one hand, they create flow, but on the other hand, they're also really good in just passively using the water flow that is um, naturally on the reef already. Amazing. And um, last, but by no means least, uh, how long can a sponge live out? I'm assuming that sponges can only live in water. If you took it out of water, how long would, would it live for? Oh, that is, a, that is a good question, because the problem is, as they are a pump, then they will also kind of get uh, air bubbles in this in this pump system. So usually we try to avoid if we if we do use them for experiments, if you have to take them out of the aquarium or whatever, we always try to keep them in water, so not exposed to air. However, I know people are sometimes doing it. We also did it before. I never did an experiment for how long they can do, but I would say if it's longer than a few minutes, then most likely they won't survive. On the other hand, it can of course be. It can of course be when you think about um, reefs, especially in, in the Pacific region, where you have a big difference bit, bit, uh, with the tides. Where sometimes also corals are completely exposed. They are also sponges, so these sponges can also survive. And in that respect, if there is enough humidity uh, around them, they might actually survive also several hours. So it's difficult to say. And I guess it also depends from sponge to sponge. I was going to ask about uh, sponges living on the intertidal zone, so so thank you for covering covering that. Um, we've talked about various functions of sponge. Uh, another question through from George is is how do they breathe? How do they respire? So uh, they not only pump water for getting food. That is of course one important thing, but at the same time they also take up oxygen from the water. When the water is, is, is running through them, they release uh, CO2 because similar to us, they're also uh, respiring. So they need oxygen, they release CO2 and they also have waste products. And also the waste products will also go out again with that water. So basically by pumping, they can do all these functions. 
Well, that's good to have one 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 activity for for so for so many different functions. Um, you you've you know we've we've seen a few images of of sponges. Uh, do, do do we know how many species of sponge there are? And that's from uh, Maya and Noah in Brittany. That is also very difficult to say because there are so many sponges. It's, so we know about several thousand uh, species of sponge, but there are as sponges can occur everywhere. We now know more and more about sponges also, uh, for example, growing in a deep sea, but we have very, very little access. We literally don't know, or if you, even on a coral reef, there's a lot of research done on a coral reef, but then if you look in small cracks and crevices and small caves, there are hundreds of different um, colorful specks that are covering the walls there. But, and if you look closer, there are actually sponges, but hardly anyone looked actually into it, what species are there? And there will be many, many, many more uh, species. So it's difficult to see, to say how many there will be. I assume a lot, and we are still uh, have a lot to explore in that field. And, and talking about being a scientist, um, there is a type of scientist I know called a taxonomist who's very, very interested in, in naming and discovering new species. You and the team aren't, aren't taxonomists, but you've been working on sponges, it seems more than pre pretty well anyone else, sort of in and around, you know, Curacao. Have you discovered new species and named them? Um, no, not really. I must also say that I, I think it's very, very important. We need uh, this information because if you look at something, we want to also be able to discriminate. Okay, that is sponge A and that is uh, sponge B. It's important to do these inventories and to be able to identify them. However, um, in our research group, we are more interested about the function and the role of sponges in the whole uh, coral reef. So therefore, we are specializing on that. However, for, for some ex certain species we can easily identify just by sight. For other ones where it is more complicated, then we take samples of these and then we send it to uh, colleagues of ours. That is what science is about. It's really about collaboration to working together with many different experts and everyone is expert on a different part and they help us then to uh, identify this, uh, the, the species and making sure there can be two sponges that look exactly the same and then you you send them out and then they say like well um, you brought us five orange pieces and it turns out to be three or four different species so uh, you have to be careful there and that is why it's important to work also together with taxonomists and and so so this, you've come across new species often in in, in your work um as we don't really uh fixate on on discovering or going for the ones that we do not know we rather have the other approach that we say like okay let's stick to the ones that we can easily identify and that we're sure what what we're at so i'm sure i saw many different species that were not described yet however i might not have even noticed that it's that it's uh, there but uh, we, we we didn't describe a new species or or found one that afterwards was then uh, uh described by by taxonomist but, um, so, um, Ben, we've got a question, question um, from Wimbledon High. Well, if sponges didn't exist, what would be the difference? A world without sponges? A world without sponges, um, I guess, um, at home, it would be much more smelly and less clean dishes, I guess. That is that is one thing, no, but but on the, on, on the reef, of course, um, I guess there would be many more uh, microbes, many more bacteria in the water because sponges are just tremendous in in filtering the water there. That's number one. And the other thing is I have, it would be really curious to see how coral reefs would work without the recycling, what the sponges are doing, without them converting this, uh, this sugar, this dissolved organic matter into particles and providing food. I expect coral reefs would be much less productive and maybe also less diverse as they are now. So fairly important then. Um, ben, we've got a number of questions um, looking at the sort of future of, of, of the reef, and including sponges. Um, from, from Wimbledon High, this question is, is um, how does the amount of dead coral in 2020 compared to the year 2000. So what have we seen about the rate of decline in the coral reef over the past 20 years? 
I think what a what a really big difference is that uh, it depends also a little bit on the region because if we I'm now here in the Caribbean and the Caribbean um, was was dealing with coral disease and and and, and many other declines already. Uh, in the past 30 40 years so basically we see a, a steady decline but in the in the past 10 20 years we actually rather see that it's not going further down it's it's rather kind of stable at some places even getting better again whereas uh, the great barrier reef in australia which was always uh, doing very well was in the past uh, decade hit by one after the other uh, mass bleaching event. And a lot of the corals then also died, some recovered, but also because these events are happening so often again, they are still weak. And then at, at one point, they just can't handle it anymore. I don't know exactly about, about uh, exact statistics, how much percent there was now lost, but I assume, especially in the Indo-Pacific region or, or Australia, which were so far um, not that affected, that they now with the coral bleaching have have massive uh, problems right now, and hopefully it is getting better. Um, and just just to check in with our audience online, if if you're not familiar with the term coral bleaching, we can go over that. But do pop into um, the live chat um, if you're not familiar with coral bleaching, and, and we'll cover the relationship between ocean warming and coral bleaching in just a bit, if that's the case. Um, from from Sydney and High Prep, we have a question. Have you found anything on the coral reef that doesn't belong there? Are there examples of you know invasive species or, or something like that? Oh. Yeah, I mean, on, on the reefs, are, as everywhere, you have everywhere invasive species. So there is, for example, um, a new cup coral that is there for a couple of years, maybe the most famous for Caribbean reefs, which made it big in the media, were lionfish. So the ones that you usually have in the Indo-Pacific or the Red Sea, beautiful fish, however, they don't belong here. And the problem is that uh, they do not have any predators, nor are there any diseases or parasites here. So there was really a massive explosion of the abundance of these fish and people were afraid because they are ferocious predators that they might uh, eat all of the uh, young fish on the reef. I think you always have it, you introduce something new and then you first get an explosion, but then over time there are some predators that are now also targeting them and there, there might be also some diseases and parasites that are targeting them now. So I think they will become part of it. It takes some time as always. That is of course with invasive species, but of course there's also a lot of other things. So what you can find, you can find flip-flops, you can find any kind of trash or, or garbage that also ends up. You can find anchors, you can find um, uh, fishing gear, many things you find on the reef that actually doesn't belong there and shouldn't be there. And, and talking about that, that trash on the reef, uh, does that just look ugly or does that harm the coral animal? That depends. Uh, that depends. It can harm the coral animal. Um, but sometimes it's even used. So you also sometimes have these have these nice pictures or videos where hermit crabs, for example, then use a kind of a plastic cup or 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 whatever as a housing. So it or Ooh. other uh, animals use it also as a as a shelter. Um, it shouldn't be there, and it's it, sometimes they're also poisonous things. I mean, it it can also be that you, you you have some some paint on them that then dissolves and it can directly harm animals. So it is it is difficult to say. In general, I would say nothing that is naturally there should be put there. So don't throw anything out. Make sure if you go also out with a boat, also just for for snorkeling or whatever. Also at the beach, don't leave your trash behind. Take everything with you afterwards because. If you're at the beach, the wind will blow it in the in the ocean, and then in the end, it ends up uh, where it shouldn't be. And and just going on from that, this is a question from Gutenberg Schuler in in Ecuador. What what's the you know we're talking about sort of stopping trash? Are there other ways, or what's the best way to stop uh, corals and sponges from disappearing? Um, I think it is it is twofold. So so on the one way, there is something what you can do where the coral reefs exactly are, and that is uh, protecting them by, for example, uh, not having sewage directly run um, out on the reef. That's number one. So basically, to have 
to, to have plans there in place. Um, another thing is to to not allow fishing everywhere on the reef, but to have certain areas, fishing areas where you can fish, but other areas where you protect it. So that is important that you have fish, especially herbivores that are then also feeding on on uh, algae and keeping the algae small. That is one thing. Another thing is then to not build on uh, coral reefs and to see where you want to build a marina or or whatever. So you do not want to uh, destroy them that way. So that is every. These things are important and they have an immediate effect basically on the reef. Also, tourism, don't step on corals, um, don't throw your anchor on the on the corals and so on and so forth. So, so there are all these things that can be done on the reef itself. But we at home, we can also do something. We can, we heard before, uh, or we talked before about the coral bleaching, which is mainly caused by um, mm. ocean warming due to climate change. So everything what we can do to reduce CO2 emissions and thereby trying to keep the warming of the earth um, as small as possible will help also the reefs. And another thing is to think about, get informed about coral reefs and then spread the word. I mean, here now you hear also a lot of things and and just spread the word, talk to other people about it, talk also to, uh, to, to, to your friends, to your, to your family. And the more people that are aware of it, why coral reefs, are so unique and why they are so special, then people make also decisions to to uh, protect them and um, to not have them disappear. And thank you. Um, the la last few questions are really focusing on on being uh, a coral scientist, being being a, a reef scientist. Um, how, how did you get into um, being a marine biologist? Your job. Well, how did I get there? Um, I already, as a, as a small child, as far as I can go back, I was fascinated by the sea, mainly through documentaries that I saw, for example, of uh, Jacques Cousteau. And I was always fascinated by the oceans. And then if you see a coral reef, that is just so much more. So I was really, I wanted to become a marine researcher. I think that is what I called it back then. And then I, I made choices all the way uh, along. So basically uh, in high school, I um, had then my major in biology and also English. So I'm I'm German, but all of the literature is in English. If As we're now talking uh, about, if you talk to colleagues, you mainly use English. So it was very important for me also to learn English well enough that I can uh, communicate. And then I studied uh, biology and uh, later on could also dare get a major in marine biology. So it's, it was a very clear set path uh, going towards it. But I know from many other colleagues that weren't doing it that way, that, that just by chance basically ended up there. They were chemists or, or they were into physics or, or mathematical modeling. And that just via a detour happened to, to uh, start working on coral reefs. So it is difficult to say there is one way that will bring you there. Um, it really depends on you. Um, you should follow what your interests lie in and then uh, always staying curious, asking questions. And then in the end, you will uh, you will there or end up somewhere else. Brilliant, Ben. Thank you very much. Um, and, you know, you, 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 your work consists, seems to consist of you, you've got the sort of sampling or the experiments on the reef, you've got the lab work, you've got the data analysis in some ways quite a sort of traditional way of doing environmental or natural sort of sciences. Um, do you see marine biology changing in the future? Uh, marine biology, so the principle will hold. The principle uh, was is still the same as it was uh, hundreds of years ago. You are, you, you are looking at it, you, you, you're wondering about something, you come up with a hypothesis and you try and find ways how to test it. The main things that are changing now is, and it's going faster and faster, is just the use of uh, genomic approaches. Now, what is new metabolomics? So that is also what we do with the, with the uh, dissolved organic matter. We want now not just to say, okay, it is so and so much carbon dissolved, but we want to see what are the actual parts of it. And But for all of these things, we need our computers. We cannot do it by hand anymore. We need computers that help us to put all this data together and to make it uh, nicely that we can understand it. We know much more. We cannot do it just by hand writing it on a piece of paper. We need modelers. We need computer models. We need 
uh, fancy statistics with computers to better understand these very complex systems. So, so Ben, I think I'm probably in the computer to understand some of the words you're using. Um, but uh, I think what, you, what you're saying there is that we've got to a stage in our investigation of these environments that the complexity, that we're getting to some very complex questions, and the amount of data that we can get, it's something that we can't, you know, do by hand. The next stage is need a computer to run those calculations to handle that amount of data. Yeah, ex exactly. And then also only then we can understand it. If you, it's the same as if you would look at a, at a computer and you have just two or three tooth wheels, you can easily see when I turn this one, that will happen. But if you have a big engine with a lot of different levers and tooth wheels and, and many other things in there, to in order to understand it, it's much more complex. And we, for us, it is too complicated. We can just figure it out with our mind. We need then the help of uh, computing techniques to, to actually get there and to better understand it. And um, we've just got a few few moments left, um, but there's a lovely question here through from Brittany, which is, is, what's the most spectacular coral you've seen? And while I know on, a, on an earlier um, call, you dodged the question of your, your favorite place in the ocean, but what if you could single out uh, a, a most spectacular uh, example of, of, of a single coral colony, wh where's that been and what made it so special? I think the biggest one I ever saw was in was here on Curacao, and it was a ginormous alcorn coral. So, so they 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 can be super super big, and just to to see that from that far and you get closer and closer and closer, it's just such a an um, amazing sight what what you have there, and it's just beautiful to 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 look at. And then you think like, okay, this coral grows maybe four or five centimeters. Uh, a year, how old must this coral be? And it still stands there in the in the breaking waves and everything. And you have the fish around, and it's just a wonder how how it can be that a tiny little coral polyp can, over years and years and years, build such a, a ginormous structure. And, and, and fantastic! I mean, is this is this a, is this a tucked away uh, coral, or is it somewhere you can go and sort of say hello every day, every other day? No, it is it is uh, at the eastern tip of the island. You cannot go there by land. You basically have to go uh, by boat. And um, I'm not even sure if I would exactly find it uh, back again because it's a rather uh, larger larger stretch. So I cannot give uh, GPS coordinates or can people say, hey, you have to swim there and there, then you will find it. Um, but no, did, did you see such a big one that is rare and it becomes uh, rarer and rarer, unfortunately. Ben, thank you so much. I think we've just got time for uh, for those watching. You know, may not have considered a career as a marine scientist, as a, as a coral scientist. Uh, what uh, encouragement and advice would you give to young people watching? So, the, what I mentioned before, the most important thing is to stay curious, to ask, to start to wonder about things, to ask questions, and then not stay at that stage, but then start to investigate, to find out, hey, how does it work? Can I find some information? There's good information out there now uh, on the internet where you, you can find, you can also contact uh, experts. And it's just stay curious and follow that. That is the most important thing. And if you then in the end end up as a marine scientist or coral scientist, great. But maybe you follow your curiosity and then you end up uh, working on uh, rainforest or you are developing the next uh, solar panel with a higher efficiency. I mean, there, there can be so many things, but I think the most important thing is really follow your, your, your passion and uh, stay curious and uh, investigate and show also your own in in initiative. It has to be intrinsic. It has to be coming uh, from you and then everything is possible. Ben, thank you. Those wonderful final messages of, you know, be passionate and stay curious. Uh, thank you so much for an insight uh, into the world of a sponge specialist, uh, a marine biologist.
It's been wonderful having um, you broadcast uh, from Curacao, and we hope that the weather gets a little bit more typically tropical um, in, in the days to come. But thank you so much for being part of Acts of Coral Live. For the rest of the week uh, on Coral Live, we are getting more and more focused on the sort of the, the exam grade type questions. So we're supporting all the students, um, so both for GCSE, A-level, sort of baccalaureate stage. Um, so do join us. We have a range of specialists talking about coral, the coral ecosystem, its relationship to humans, and what the future of coral might be like. Until then, uh, thank you and thank you, Ben. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.